Baroness Sophie Buxkevden, was a Baltic German lady in waiting, in service to Empress Alexandra of Russia. She was the author of three memoirs about the imperial family, and about her own escape from Russia. The following account, consists of her memories of Tsarevich Alexei Nikolaevich Romanov. On August 12, 1904, the longed-for son, the heir Alexei, was born. Those who knew how the Empress had prayed and waited for this crowning happiness in her married life, and who understood the importance of direct succession in a country like Russia, can realize what this meant to her. The boy was big and healthy, and early gave promise of great good looks. No signs of the hemophilia that afterwards developed in him were noticeable at the outset. Notwithstanding the serious atmosphere caused by the war, the baby's advent gave unmitigated joy to the parents. My sunbeam, the empress used to call her boy. The birth of Alexei gave the empress popularity. The criticism that had been heard of her too great domesticity was heard no more. The empress had done her duty to the country, and the knowledge of this gave her greater self-confidence. The baby was beautiful. He developed rapidly and seemed a strong fine child. His teething gave him no trouble, and he was exceptionally bright and well-developed. The proud parents exhibited the splendid little fellow to the public whenever they could. He was not a year old, when in his mother's arms he was shown to the soldiers at a review, and baby behaved well. When he started trotting about independently and had occasional tumbles, the Empress noticed that the boy seemed to suffer more from his bumps than the small accident warranted. In deadly terror, but without speaking of it to anyone, Alexandra watched her darling with a fear in her heart that she did not dare to put into words. As the child grew older and more active, he developed the typical swellings that pointed to hemophilia, the dreadful disease from which one of her uncles had suffered and the Empress realized that her only son, her beloved Sunbeam, had the same terrible weakness. Doctors confirmed her fears, though they said that the heir was suffering from a mild form only of the disease. His mother's despair can be imagined at hearing her worst fears confirmed. Her agony was the more acute, as she knew that it was through her that the boy had inherited the illness. She was in no way to blame but this did not lessen her terrible feeling of responsibility. Both she and the Emperor hid their anxieties from the world, hoping against hope that there might be some mistake. Alexei was perfectly well and strong between his attacks, which were caused only by some rash movement on his part, and the Empress always hoped that in the intervals a merciful providence had wrought a miracle. Once, two whole years passed without a single hemorrhage. The mother revived, her health improved, she looked her former self. Alas! It proved to be a forlorn hope. The boy fell ill again, and though the cause was hidden from everyone, and the parents still trusted that he might completely recover, the doctors had few illusions. This grief destroyed the Empress's joy in life. The look of sadness that had always from time to time come over her face, now settled on it forever. For the sake of her boy's future, she hid her sorrow so well, that in the country the nature of the heir's complaint was unknown. It was whispered about in the palace, but even there, no one knew definitely what was the reason of his frequent sudden illnesses. The strain under which she lived, told gradually on the Empress's health. 
She was obliged to keep more and more to her sofa. Her heart began to trouble her in 1908. She never complained. It was even difficult to make her say how she really felt, but any exertion became such a visible effort that the doctors warned the emperor about her health and a cure at Norheim was prescribed. The empress disliked intensely the idea of making a fuss about herself. She said to her sister the Princess Louis of Battenberg, it was despairing. In another letter to her, on June 5, 1910, she wrote, Don't think my ill health depresses me personally. I don't care, except to see my dear ones suffer on my account, and that I cannot fulfill my duties. But once God sends such a cross, it must be born. Darling Mama also lost her health at an early age. I have had so much, that willingly I give up any pleasures. They mean so little to me, and my family life is such an ideal one, that it is a recompense for anything I cannot take part in. Baby is growing a little companion to his father. They row together daily. All five lunch with him daily, even when I am laid up. Alexei was not impressed by his own importance, and his simple courteous manner was like his father's. He knew and felt that he was the heir, and from babyhood mechanically took his place in front of his elder sisters. But he took no pride in the position that he knew was his due, and after the revolution gave it up quite quietly, without a word. His chief friend was the son of Dr. Derevenko, and as a small child he played with the sons of his sailor servant, whose name also, curiously enough, was Derevenko. All the children adored their mother, but her constant care of him made a particular bond of love between mother and son. When the emperor left for general headquarters in 1915, Alexei said to me that he felt he was the man in the house. It was delightful to see the grown-up way in which he would look after the empress when they went to church or to some function together. He would help her to rise or would unobtrusively push a chair towards her as the emperor might have done. From the very first, the empress looked after her children's education herself. She gave them their first spelling lessons and taught them their prayers, going up each evening to pray with them, a custom which she kept up to the end with Alexei. As the children grew older, they had of course their own teachers. The heir had an excellent tutor in Monsieur Pierre Gilliard, a Swiss, who was helped after 1915 by an English colleague, Mr. Sidney Gibbs. Alexandra was economical and knew the value of money. She dressed well but not extravagantly. She chose the clothes that suited her type and hated the extremes of fashion. She looked magnificent in full dress and was always beautiful. She never impoverished the treasury by having costly jewels bought for herself. She had many fine jewels that were family heirlooms. Most of the crown jewels were still worn by the Dowager Empress, but as the big tiaras she wore on state occasions, were the crown jewels put aside for the wife of the heir. She used laughingly to say that when Alexei married, she would have to hand them over and do what she could for herself. For many years, she had believed that bad luck pursued the emperor and herself. For Alexei, on the other hand, she had the greatest hopes. She was ready to bear everything, in order that he might come into his inheritance. His reign should be glorious, he should institute the reforms for which his parents would slowly prepare. 
She believed, with a fatalism that she shared with the emperor, that they were the scapegoats for all the errors committed in previous reigns. Perhaps the lives of all princes were too easy, they had to suffer as an expiation for the good things taken without thought by preceding generations. Based strictly on primary sources, the book The Romanov Royal Martyrs offers previously unpublished texts in English from various archival sources. An impressive 512-page book featuring more than 200 black and white photographs and a 56-page full-color photo insert.